Great, Brian, Andre, and, and Mary, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to, to be here presenting to you all. Uh, and I think I speak for everybody when, when I uh, express our gratitude just for, for holding this series at all. It's, uh, it's nice to have these opportunities, um, especially throughout, throughout this pandemic. So, so thanks again. Uh, so yeah, so this is joint work with Eric Gillia, um, we've got Wharton, and uh, you know, I just want to start by, by pointing out what, what we think are two uh, big trends in, in sort of our field. And the first is that we, we have seen a giant decline in public firms, at least publicly listed here in the United States, uh, over the last two decades, right? So from its peak in the late 90s through sort of the present, they've essentially been cut. Right. And so we think this really suggests, you know, that public uh, or excuse me, private firms are, are becoming more important than some, right? And they now account for roughly half of all economic output. And, and certainly if you look at business entities just in terms of numbers, right, they're, they're up around 90%. So really there's a, a big importance of, of knowing, you know, more about private firms, right? Uh, they, they also have really large differences in friction, both agency frictions and financial frictions. And uh, it's an open question as to how those frictions tend to impact various aspects of it, right? But, but at the same time, historically, due to data constraints, these, these have been hard questions to answer, okay? So that's the first trend that, that we wanted to, to sort of think about as we motivate our patients. The second is we have this, at least, you know, among the popular press and, and, and people at large, this, this idea that non-shareholder stakeholders are really important. Right, and so you can think of this as that the environment, right, CSR, sustainable green investment, uh, social justice and inequality, the local community, and employees, right? So, so even if firms aren't uh, sort of explicitly taking these into their profit maximization function, uh, they, they sort of implicitly enter them. Um, and, and so this has become an important uh, aspect of the firm's decision-making as well. Okay, so this paper really, tries to look at it at the intersection of these two trends. So our question is, is really is really basic. How does listing status, public or private listing status, affect workplace safety? Right. And, and we're gonna we're gonna think about how this is 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 interacting with potential trade-offs with, with labor productivity. Okay, now theory is going to offer competing predictions, uh, particularly with regard to workplace safety, about, about which way the, the direction is going to go. Right, so on the one hand, you can think of public firms having safer workplaces, right? They have higher costs of, of adverse work conditions uh, with greater disclosure, stockholder and political pressure. They might have higher reputational risks or costs due to sort of more exposure or, or uh, a, a greater uh, breadth of, of, of the firm itself. Um, and, and then do they have better access to external capital. So if they are constrained, they're less likely to have to cut uh, safety investment. Okay. On the other hand, we can also think there's many reasons for private firms to be safer. Right? They're closely held, owners are less diversified, which means they might be incapable or unwilling to take on extra risk in terms of safety. Uh, there might be less agency costs that, that drive you know, different decisions within the firm to take on uh, more, more safety risk or might have less pressure at cost. Um, and, and then owners might actually have a personal ties to the local community in which, you know, in which their business is located. Okay, so we think ultimately this is, this is a empirical question and, and it's not clear, at least at the beginning of us, it wasn't clear which direction this was going to go. Okay, so what we're going to do is focus on one, uh, on one industry here in the United States. And it's in the title, but, you know, to reinforce it, we're going to look at coal. Okay, so why coal? Um, and then there's a couple of reasons. One, it's one of the most dangerous industries in the Okay, so if we're going to think about the big trade-offs firms have to make in terms of safety investments, because of cost, etc., coal seems like a pretty good laboratory for safety. Okay, because of this dangerous nature of the industry, there's also really high disclosure requirements for the firms, right? And that safety data is, is collected, reported in a standardized way across both public and private firms for over 30 years, uh, you know, in, in terms of our standards. We get this it's really kind of full safety data. Okay, and, and then we also have asset level data on employment, hours work, and, and production of coal, which is really gonna help us get at what kind of trade-offs firms make in terms of this, uh, uh, of this safety decision. Okay, so to preview our results, in case I don't get into uh, to all of them, we're gonna think about listing status change uh, as, as somewhat of a treatment. 
Okay, and then we're going to look at three outcome groups. The first two we're going to think of as the workplace safety environment, and that's the, the number of safety violations and the number of fatalities, the fatal accidents that are from experiences. And the other is going to be the productivity of employees. Okay, and what we see, at least in baseline tests, safety violations, uh, broadly speaking, uh, stay about the same, or at least don't go up in, in terms of statistically significant uh, coefficients. Okay, but what we do see is fatalities explode. Okay, so the number of uh, fatal accidents goes up by, by 440%, and the productivity of the labor goes up by about 13%. Okay, in digging in a bit more to the safety violations, we actually have the classification of the regulator as to how risky these, these activities are. Okay, so you can think of these as sort of being low probability, medium probability, or high probability of actually leading to an accident. Okay, so these are ex anti safety. And what we see is the firm, the public firms that are sample do take on more safety risks, but it's concentrated in these activities that are sort of the lowest class of risks, those that are least likely to lead to an accident. Okay, so those go up by about 57 percent. Okay, and digging in a little bit more to the mechanism, we, we look with inside high productivity mines and we find huge increases in safety violations. Okay, so it does look like it's a within mine trade. Firms, you know, as they go public, or, or public firms that acquire privately held mines, they're they're actually, you know, it looks like increasing their safety violations, but also realizing higher level productivity. Okay, and then to get at the, the the mechanism just a little bit, we can think of uh, two scenarios: one in which information asymmetry between public firm owners and and managers is driving sort of this this trade off. Okay, so. If we look at coal price declines, and, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of, of why we think this is altering cost and benefits in terms of information asymmetry uh, later in the slides. But what we see again is all of these safety violations and the productivity increases is concentrated in years in which coal prices are going down. Okay, then finally, we're going to try and get at if, if the sort of the concentration of private firm ownership in, in, in the area around. The, the headquarters of the firm, we think this is sort of the local community in which these owners are likely to reside, if this is driving sort of this, this optimization problem for the community. So we look at mines near headquarters, and once again, this is where we see the largest increases in, in safety violations and productivity. Okay, so that's the preview of the results. You know, trying to think about where this paper fits in the literature, there's a lot of really, really good work um, on, on both public private listing status. And employee safety. You know, so thinking about listing status, we have some really good papers that look at capital structure, dividends, uh, investment, innovation, pollution. Okay, and then a huge literature, obviously, on why firms go public, what happens when they do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also have a, a really big and growing literature on employee wealth, right? And so you can think of sort of direct costs of, of you know firm financial policies and, and friction. You know, leading to loss of employment, et cetera. But then there's a, a growing literature on actual workplace safety. Um, you know, so this is work done by, by Jonathan Cohn and Malcolm Wardlaw and, and uh, the Story Act. You know, this, this forthcoming paper is probably the closest to ours in which they look at private equity buyouts of firms and find that OSHA violations drop significantly um, after that, that private equity buyout. Um, you know, so we're, we're hopeful that our, our paper sheds some more light on, on some of these frictions that are leading to the safety. Okay, so, and you know, not to be, you know, too tongue in cheek here, but we think of our paper as fitting into the mix here uh, by adding this, this trade off mechanism, uh, you know, from sort of fit. Okay, before I get into data, I'll stop here and, and see if there's, there's any questions that would be good to address. Now. Yeah, a couple of questions. So, one, um, are, how generalizable are these results? Uh, it's, it seems like in this industry, there's a more transparency. Um, in terms of safety than maybe other industries. So these private firms, private coal firms are likely to respond differently than say other private firms. Yeah, all right, that's a, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know who asked it, but um, I, I don't know that at this moment, I have a, a ton to say that to that. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, if I have time an extension where we, we get away from comparing public and private and look within private firms. And, and I think it, it, it suggests a similar mechanism when we get to what we think of as probably more closely held private firms, um, which, you know, I don't know if that 
that suggests that our results are, are super generalizable to other industries. But I think it does suggest that it's not just about, you know, sort of public firm disclosure. You know, there's a, there's a nice paper by Christensen and co-authors in JAE a, a few years ago that looks at this industry and looks at what happens when, you know, we increase disclosure in financial documents, you know, so sort of 8Ks, things like that. Um, and they, they sort of find similar results. So we think our results aren't just about disclosure, but, but really more about some of the other frictions um, that differ between uh, public and private firms. But, but it is, I think, a good question to, to the extent that we can sort of you know, make a big generalizable statement about that. Uh, one more question, I guess, probably related to what you're going to say on this slide, but um, so are you only looking at IPOs or are you looking at firms that are acquired by publicly listed firms? Yeah, both. Um, you know, so when we get into, a, I'll get into our identity strategy here in just a minute, but yeah, we're not going to, we're, at least in our main results, we're not going to differentiate between the two, you know, in some robust success, we can make sure that it's it's not just an effect that's, that's coming from IPOs, but, but rather, you know, it seems to be there both in IPOs and when public firms acquire what were once privately held mines, whether through individual mine purchases or, or more frequently through the, the purchase of, uh, of, of an actual private. Okay, that's it for now. Great. All right, so our data. So the vast majority of our data is, is simple, publicly available uh, data that's collected by the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Okay, so if you go to their website, you can essentially find all the data that, that we use, you know, using this paper. So it's it's really cool granular data. Um, and so it has mine level information on accidents, industry, injuries, excuse me, illnesses, safety violations, penalties, employment, production, coal dust samples, uh, you know, mine location, production status, ownership, right? So all of that data essentially comes from the Mine Safety and Health Administration and it's through an open government uh, initiative to sort of in in increase disclosure, right? And transparency within this industry. Okay, so, so what we combine that with is listing status, which it, it sounds like sort of an easy task, right? To, to find when these coal firms IPO or if they're public and then off you go. <laughs> this ended up being uh, sort of way more involved than, than I had pictured. Um, Number one, it's just, it's, it's harder than I thought it would be to find IPO dates. So, you know, we look at a number of, of uh, sources, Edgar and Chris, Capital IQ, Jay Ritter's website with his IPO dates. Um, you know, so it, it's sort of amazing when you know a firm is public, but can't find their actual IPO date, um, you know, especially if it's years in the past. So that's sort of challenge number one, but sort of more pertinent is, is trying to figure out sort of some of the complex trees of, of ownership structures that, that these, uh, these coal firms sort of engage in, right? So, you know, if you, if you find a, a, a coal firm is private, you know, it, 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 it's one thing to, to just say it's private, it's quite another to see, okay, is it a subsidiary who owns it, et cetera, and, and try and follow that. Okay, so this was actually a, a non trivial task. Um, and I have to thank my, my RA for, for the majority of that. Okay, and then we're going to uh, finally use coal price data from the US uh, EIA, which is available for nation. Okay, and then we're going to try and, and, and sort of standardize our sample a little bit. So we're going to use a number of filters to sort of uh, attempt to do that. For you know, filter number one, we're going to we're going to throw out the, the sort of the smallest uh, the smallest firms, right? So these mom and pop shops that just have a shovel and they're going and digging in, in sort of the backyard. We're going to get rid of those. Um, we're going to focus on bituminous coal, not uh, anthracite. You know, this ends up not being a, a major filter, uh, but we just want to standardize. That, that we're looking at here. Um, and then the ultimate owner is not foreign, not part of a joint venture, not a sole proprietorship or a partnership, and they own at least two mines total. So again, you know, trying to standardize the sample. Again, most of these filters don't do much to, to diminish our sample. The big one is it's not part of a joint venture. A lot of these coal mines are operated as part of joint ventures, you know, sometimes between two public firms, sometimes private, but oftentimes there's a, there's a mix as well. And, uh, and so, you know, not knowing exactly how to classify the ownership structure of those three ventures for now. Okay, so this leads to a little over 4,000 uh, coal mines owned by about 1,400 parents, 68 of which are public at some point in our sample, giving us a, a total of 21,538 mines. Per month. Okay, and so, you know, coal in the United States, you can think of this as being sort of a mid-Atlantic type of deal, and, and our sample is no different. 
you know, so we see lots of clustering of, of our mines, um, you know, through West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, and, and Kentucky. But, but we also have some big surface coal mines, you know, out here in, in the West. You know, I think the main thing I take away from this picture, it doesn't look like it's sort of locational clustering at Italy Hodges and Waterford. Okay, so, you know, one thing, you know, and, and I know that, you know, I, I thought I saw Jonathan uh, Cohn here in the, in the audience, you know, I, I'm sure he's thought about this a lot too. I think anyway, that measuring good or bad workplace safety is pretty difficult, right? And, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. One, you know, what, what do we focus on? Ex ante or ex post? Okay, so if we think about ex post, so this is Jonathan Faber Malcolm in the JF 2006, they used sort of accident propensity. These have random components, right? Accidents, you know, they, there's a, a predictable component, then there's a, a random component. And these ex post measures uh, are going to have a big random component, right? Uh, at the same time, if we use ex ante measures, we think of things as OSHA violations, uh, you know, these arise, I think, at least from my understanding, mostly from irregular inspections. Right, which drives this question, which firms, which plants are inspected, why, you know, what's driving that decision from the regulator to inspect the plant. And we also have this, this problem where, where firms and industries have sort of significant heterogeneity in terms of their accident propensities or their, or their safety investments they have to make, right? You can think of like sort of start thing, retail versus manufacturing. Um, and, and then lastly, what, what do we think of as, as sort of tangible safety costs? Right, you know, a lot of accidents you know, are contusions or sprains or you know bruises. You know, is this really a tangible safety cost for the firm? And, and you know, I think probably not. Right, so we think of our, our setting as allowing us to make progress on sort of each of these challenges. Okay, so we're going to use two empirical measures for our workplace safety. The first is safety violations from the regulator for potential accidents. Right, so again, this is purely ex ante uh, measure of workplace safety. Now, the nice thing about, about this industry is that they arise from regular inspections. Okay, so this is mandated by the 1990, uh, excuse me, 1977 Federal Mine Safety and Health Act, four times annual for underground mines and two times annually for service mines. Right, so no matter what, every year underground mines are inspected for service. Okay, now, of course, if mines are, are sort of thought to be more dangerous and they can be inspected more, and if, uh, if, if you know there's complaints or, or worries about accident safety or excuse me, workplace safety from employees or sort of other stakeholders, again, they can be expected. But this is sort of the baseline. Okay. The other nice thing about this industry is that it's relatively homogenous, right? We have pretty standardized types and severity of safety risk uh, from, from firm to firm. They're all operating at the same time, right? And, and we have this nice uh, granularity in our data that uh, is going to allow us to sort of further homogenize, right? So MISHA, the regulator here that does the inspections, subcategorizes safety violations into three categories. Those that have a low probability of an accident occurring, a medium probability, and a high probability. Right? So we can further look within these subcategories to, to, to get a better idea of what's going on. Okay. And, and they use some different some different language, but it's just for ease of uh, exposition here, we'll call it low. Okay, so this is sort of the annual uh, trends in safety violations. We started our sample in 1993. Now, this is after talking with Misha when the data is pretty, pretty good uh, to go. Um, so they actually have safety violations going back into the 80s, uh, but, but they're pretty negligent uh, from 1993. So we, we start there. And, uh, you know, even though the industry is getting sort of more safe through time, uh, it, it looks like these are a little bit secular, right? Uh, and so we get sort of peaks leading up to the, the, the dot-com bubble and, and the financial crisis. The second empirical measure we're gonna use is the balance. Now, I, I sort of picked on this, uh, this ex post measure uh, just a little bit in my earlier slide, um, and, and fatalities are sort of worse, right, in terms of that random component than just a simple accident propensity. Accident propensity. But what we think we get from, from fatalities are, are something that really represents the largest cost to mining firms stemming from sort of either an underinvestment in workplace safety or additional uh, workplace safety. Okay, so it really represents what we think of as tangible safety costs for the firm. Okay, and, and here you, I think you get a better idea that, that you know, safety has been increasing. You know, so aside from some of the big mine disasters, say the, the big ranks mining disaster in 2010, you know, it looks like uh, that these are, are decreasing. 
Okay, so I'll stop here in just a second and, and take a few more questions. But here's the summary stats. Um, you know, nothing that I, I think is particularly noteworthy, other than you know, if you look at the median mine in, in our sample, it doesn't look so bad, right? You're, you're looking at ten safety violations a year. You know, one injury in which you know there's maybe thirty-one days that that worker has to miss. Fines like two thousand dollars. You know, so so it's really not that bad. But sort of the most egregious violators. Uh, in terms of mine, you know, look really dangerous, right? So we get 1,400 uh, safety violations, you know, 300 injuries, 50, uh, 13 fatalities, and, and 3 million in fines in, in sort of one year. Um, you know, so I, I think that's my big takeaway from the summary stats is on average, at least, I thought <laughs> our, our median that the mines would be a, a little more. Uh, maybe that's uh, a company fact, I'm not sure. Um, so I'll take uh, Ryan questions if there are any. Yeah, a few questions related to these uh, inspections. Um, first, is there, just to clarify, is there any difference in the way that the inspectors treat these uh, private versus public firms? Uh, not stated. Um, you know, so if there, if there is, it's, it's, it's latent. You know, we can't, we can't see it. As, as There's no sort of legal differences in reporting. So, uh, I mean, the, so the only, you know, this Christensen at all paper in the JAE, the only difference is that you know, public firms have to, to file eight, uh, eight case after accidents and fatalities now. That happened in 2010 or 11 with the Dodd Frank Act, I believe. Um, but in terms of like you know, our data, the reporting, the inspections, everything on the Mitchell website is completely standard, standardized as far as we know across public. Okay, uh, next uh, question. Do the mine operators know in advance when these inspections are going to take place? That is a good question. And, uh, and it's one I don't have uh, a great answer to. I would suspect that they, they often do. Uh, you know, as an anecdote of that, um, and, you know, the, the big branch mine uh, disaster, this was Massey Energy. You know, they, they were said to have two different books of, of sort of safety uh, environment. One, you know, that was real and the other for the regulator. You know, so that to me suggests that they have some idea and that, you know, the, the the regulars that aren't just popping in um, all the time, at least. Um, but, but we should have a better idea of that. So I think that's a good question. Uh, I guess uh, another question is, it looks like, you know, this is my, I'm just thinking right now as I'm looking at the data. So you've got sort of a few very large firms, mm -hmm. I guess. Are those the public firms? Uh, yeah, by and large, the public firms are going to be larger, though there's some very big private firms that are sample as well. OK. That's it. Okay. okay, so our identification strategy. So, you know, sort of full disclosure, we don't have a natural experiment, you know, and finding an instrument for public listing status is, is difficult. You know, you could pick up a uh, Bernstein paper for, for IPO and, and innovation as, as in, in sort of one thing, but, you know, it, it, with, with annual data, it's a little bit hard to do something like that. What we're going to rely on mostly here is the, the sort of the richness of our. So if, you, if you're familiar with this, this 2013 RF SPA uh, you know, we're going to really focus on a granular set of pictures, right? We're going to zoom into the asset level um, and, and compare within mine changes and listing stats, right? So we're going to we're going to look within that same asset uh, what happens before and after, you know, a, a listing status change. So we, we think it's going to mitigate most of sort of the most salient in dot change concerns, um, you know, but. We can also further look within region, uh, within regulator uh, area, within a, a certain firm. Okay, and, and then if that's not quite good enough for you, which, which I assume it won't be, we're going to try and, and convince you that we have a couple plausibly exogenous, uh, you know, sort of subsample results that that make it the, the burden for coming up with sort of alternative uh, interpretations of our results pretty hard. Right, so we have full price shocks and, and then inspection office changes. That, that we think alter the cost and benefit structure for each mine, and it's going to help us tease out the channels um, you know, that affect this, this trade off. Okay, so you can think of our empirical strategy sort of like this visual. Then we have three mines in a given region at time one. As of time two, that second mine here becomes public. And that's you know, through an IPO or an acquisition of a public private company. Okay, so we're able to compare changes in safety or productivity within that same mine from time T to time T equals one to time T equals two. And then compare it with these other mines in the same region, right? Both to this mine one that stays private the whole time and this mine three that stays public the whole time. Okay, and then even further, we're going to be able to look within firm 
right? So you think about this term one, if it's an IPO, we, we look at you know, what changes the format for IPO, or this term two, if it was if it's an acquisition. Okay, so sort of in, uh, in math, this is what our specification looks like. So, you know, we're going to use this log one plus, and, uh, and I'm sensitive to, to a paper uh, by, by Jonathan and, and co authors that, that look at the potential issues with this. So if you bear with me for, for just a minute, I'm going to show some, some robustness that suggests at least hopefully this isn't a main concern. Okay, we're going to control for some time varying stuff, right, that we think hopefully gets at uh, size, you know, so the number of mines owned by a firm, scale of operations uh, at the mine, uh, life cycle effects with age, and then we actually have unionized uh, status at the, at the mine year level as well. Okay, and then like I said, we're going to have this granular set of fixed effects. Okay, the biggest one we think here is, is this mine fixed effect. We think of this as standardizing investment opportunity set, technologies, whether they be production or safety. You know, think about the natural ventilation systems for a mine, for example. Cost structures, reserves, and resources uh, are all going to be standardized with this, with this fixed effect. Then we have county. You know, I think the biggest one that we get with this county fixed effect is, is the sort of standardizing the supply of labor. Right? If you think of, of some of these mines, you know, if, if Dad worked at the mine. Your grandpa worked at the mine. You work at the mine, right? They're all the all the labor basically coming from the local community. So this is going to help standardize something like that. And then finally, you know, you can think of this inspection office fixed effect of standardizing the regulator or the local. We think it's especially important when we're trying to use these subclassifications. You know, if there's a different regulator that that sort of just has a different standard for what goes into lower or high probability than the most. Okay, so what we see in our baseline specification is nothing, at least nothing significant. We get fairly big coefficients. You know, you're, you're talking about a 25 or 40% increase in, in safety violations, but, but not significant, at least consistently across different specifications. Okay, so, you know, you might ask why. You know, maybe maybe listing status has no impact on workplace, right? And, and then we could just call it a uh, but, but, you know, on the other hand, maybe it's just a nuanced effect, right? And so, you know, what I have in mind here is, we have this big category of all safety violations, but perhaps there's some remaining heterogeneity in the type of severity of, of the safety risk of the permit taking, right? And so we're going to try and utilize and exploit this classification from the regulator uh, by splitting our, our safety violations into these classes based on the probability uh, assigned by MISHA that the accident actually would occur from this violation. Okay, so this is the distribution of the of the different uh, of the different classes. And obviously, low probability of the most likely to, to, to get, um, and the high probability of the very likely to get. Okay, when we do this, we see something very different. You know, we still see not much, but it's in this group of violations that are, lead, are excuse me, most likely to lead to an accident. Okay, and, and at the same time, we see uh, that 47 is wrong, it should be 57, but 57% increase among violations that are least likely to lead to an accident. And then, you know, just to ensure that we don't have something funny going on with our log one plus, we've got a bunch of different specifications here. We just do count of the OLS. Uh, we have some data for inspection. So you can see it cuts down our sample in, in about half. But, but when using that, you know, and, and normalizing by inspections, we see something very similar. Um, and, and then whether we normalize by employees or employee hours, you know, the, the general gist of the results states was that, you know, the low violations are the sort of the biggest uh, effect amongst public firms, and then it's sort of this monotonic decrease in medium. Impact. So, you know, it, this is, uh, sorry, before I go on, you know, it looks like it's happening right at the time of the listing status change. In fact, from time T minus one to time T minus, uh, T minus two, excuse me, to T minus one, we actually see a decrease, and then we get a large jump in, in these low probability uh, violations. That doesn't seem to decrease. All right, so we think this is inconsistent with with some of the stories that you could tell about a listing status change, or you know, there's new employees or new management, and things are sort of up in the air. Uh, you know, the, the fact that it's not sort of reverting to the mean, uh, we think suggests a sort of a permanent effect. It's not natural. Okay, so so to us, this appears that public firms do take additional safety risks or have works workplace safety environments, but they don't look reckless. Right, it's it's not that they're they're going out there and, and you know putting putting their uh, employees on the chopping block. It's it's rather they're augmenting their risk distribution to include some of these these activities that are very low probability. 
right? And, and you know, the, the regulators catch up for this, but, but you know, if there's some benefit to this, um, you know, then you can think of this as, as what we what we would call a targeted approach. Okay. But but given this targeted approach, I, I, I think it's fair to wonder if this really impacts you know the costs of this of this environment sort of approach. You know, if fines are, are relatively low, especially for low probability violations, then this might be sort of you know negligible. Okay, so what we do next then is look at what would be we think the biggest cost to the firm. And that's if these, these environments and additional safety risks lead to more fatalities, right? If our workers are, are really being put in the environment. Okay, so we're going to run a very similar specification. We're going to drop the log one plus because of all the zeros that we have in, in total fatalities. Um, we utilize essentially the same set of fixed effects um, minus the, the uh, inspection office uh, fixed effects that, that we don't think should, should affect fatalities at all. And, and what we see is, is something pretty similar. Um, in, in fact, the increase is, is enormous, right? So relative to the sample mean, these coefficients represent sort of like 440 Okay, and then to make sure this isn't just in those, you know, those huge mining disasters, we actually look at the number of fatalities just in single minor accidents, and, and they're even stronger. So it looks like, you know, this really is sort of an overall safety effect rather than you know, once in a while, they just have this huge gap. Okay, and again, we can look at alternate specifications, you know, and, and normalized by employees or employee hours, and it's extremely safe as well. Okay, once again, looks like the fatalities are decreasing right before the listing status change and then explode right at the time of the IPO. Okay, so to sort of summarize, you know, we see large declines in safety. When we think about firm changing to public, right? Uh, it's obviously going reverse. We do have some public to private events, but the minimum, um, you know, the, by, by and large, these are, are two public listing status changes. We see a huge, huge increase in violations and, 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 and fatalities. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Uh, clarifying question. So, do you know that the, do you have more details on the types of, uh, events or the types of uh, conditions that led to these um, reports? In other words, what, what was it that was low probability or what maybe even caused the fatality? We, we, I mean, we, can, we can dig into the text from the reports. We do have that data, you know, like, you know, was it a machine, you know, that, that malfunctioned, uh, was it a, a coal dust explosion? Um, so we do, we do have some of that stuff, um, although, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that we've done sort of a, a large scale textual analysis on, on those details. Um, it, it seems to be a pretty big mix of what's going on. Um, uh, in terms of the, the low probability, you know, the interesting thing is the fatalities sort of look like they're coming from these low probability violations. Yeah, right? that's so, the question. And that, that's what I thought you were asking. So if I, you know, if I were to look at low, low, uh, low medium and high probability uh, safety violations, and, and then looked at if it, if it predicts fatalities, the low probability events do seem to predict fatalities even better than, than medium or high, which, you know, I don't know if it's, it's, uh, it's good or bad, it, it just looks like that. Okay, another question about uh, these this graph. So can you talk a bit about the timing, the jump in violations and fatalities appears to show up right after a firm goes public. Is this quicker than we might expect? What do we think changes so quickly that would cause this jump? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we haven't given a ton of thought. When I show you the productivity results, that we do see those come with a lag. Um, you know, it, it looks like about a year lag in, in, in the increase of productivity, um, which, which maybe is more intuitive. Um, you know, I, I guess you could think of as, you know, when when a firm IPOs or when a, a public firm uh, buys a private mine, maybe they attract more attention from the regulator, at least initially. Um, you know, changes in management, changes in firm conditions. You know, maybe this is a time where where there's a heightened attention to regulate take note, which which could, you know, suggest that that that's why it's happening so quickly. Um, you know, I, I I should think more about that. It's a good question. Um, I, I don't have a better answer than that. Uh, that's all the questions for now. Okay. Okay, so what do these firms gain from this additional safety risk? Um, you know, and, and I think one obvious uh, place to start is, is maybe they realize higher prices, right? I think it's pretty intuitive 
to, to think that we're, we're taking some more risks, um, you know, that, that we hope that they they're, are leading something in terms of outcomes. Okay, now there's some some sort of precedent for at least uh, these trade offs happening in aggregate. You know, so there's some studies back in the 80s that look at this this mine uh, health and safety act of 69 and find that fatalities go down, but production per man hour also goes down, which is you know consistent with this trade off. You know, but on the other hand, it's, it's sort of not uh, it's not sort of decided in the literature. There are a bunch of studies, you know, through the, the industry reports and, and others that find a productive mine is actually a safe mine. Um, you know, in terms of worker uh, worker health and, and so it's, it's not clear. Um, you know, but what about within firms and mines? Okay, so I first I, I just want to give this anecdote, and, and it's not like sad. I think it's enlightening. Okay, so I, I, I'm guessing most of us, uh, at least some of us, have heard of this Upper Big Branch mine design. Okay, so this is in 2010, a huge coal dust explosion in, uh, in this mine in West Virginia, and it, and it led to the unfortunate uh, death, uh, death of, of 29 of the, of the employees there. Okay, what, what I, I'm guessing less of us know is that the, 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 um, the safety conditions of this mine have been in question for a while. And uh, so this came out of some of the, of the reports. So this is a quote that I found. It said, if you don't start running coal up there, I'm going to bring the whole crew outside and get rid of every one of you. Another version says, if you don't start running coal, grab your bucket and go home. It's just of it is, if you don't, if you don't start producing, right, you're fired. And this came from Chris Blanchard, who is the president of PCC, the operator of the of the Upper Big Branch mine. And this happened just a couple of days before the coal dust explosion. So why did he say this? The section foreman had stopped production for an hour or two to fix ventilation issues. Uh, you know, if you're not not up to date on, on sort of coal dust explosions, as I was before this project, ventilation issues are the biggest reason for coal dust. Right, it's, there's no place for the dust to go. It bundles up, and then any sort of spark um, can cause these big explosions. Okay, so I think this is, is highlighting this trade-off, and it's said that Massey CEO Don Blankenship himself it will pressure PCC to, to sort of immediately resume production and stop working on any safety. Okay, of course, Massey CEO Don Blankenship ended up in prison for this accident, um, but but I think again this highlights the trade-off between workplace safety and, and productivity that you can see even with. Okay, and this is consistent with this, this Christensen J. Uh, okay, so the first thing we look at is just our public firm mines help publicly firm uh, mines uh, more productive, and then they are, right? And this is, again, no matter how we define our, our productivity increases or whether it's per hour for employee, whether we log it, whether we don't, public firms have, have more productive assets in terms of labor. Right, okay, so upon an IPO or a, Acquisition, we're talking 13 to 16 percent. And this, as I mentioned before, is, is coming with a lot. Okay, so, you know, I, I think the question before, you know, get highlights that, that we should give some more thought to, to some of these tiny, uh, tiny. Yeah. So, is this really a within mine trade off? It, it, you know, it's certainly possible, but, but our results so far, uh, they just show that public health mines are, are less safe and more productive. But you can imagine sort of alternative mechanisms, right? So one of those mechanisms might be, you know, maybe public firms are just better at allocating resources, right? Both in terms to the production and safety to sort of mines with, with better tech, right? So there, there becomes this division between mines, right? So safe, productive mines become safer and more productive, where dangerous mines, you know, sort of become less productive and less safe. Right? So to, to get at this, we're gonna split our sample. Okay, so we're gonna Reestimate our models after splitting our sample into two groups. Okay, mines that have big productivity increases over the life of the mine, and those that we think of as small. So we're, we're splitting on Churchill here. So we're calling the upper Churchill of productivity gains the, the big increases in productivity, and those in the lower two, so the small. Okay, so this is how we define that productivity gain. You can think of this as just the average productivity, you know, per, per man hour. In the last five years of the mine, minus the first five years. Okay, so what we see here is that all of the declines in workplace safety are concentrated in this group that has the biggest productivity. Okay, so I mean, and these are huge. We're, we're, we're looking at about 130 percent increase in low probability safety violations in this group of mines that that has become the most productive of the first five years. Those are 
statistically significant, uh, different than each other in the subsample. And, and once again, we see nothing really in this, this group of violations that we classify as high Okay, so to, to get an idea of this, you know, again, we think of this as, as an actual in, in my trade off here. So to, to try to quantify this, we, we did a very simple back of the envelope calculation. Okay, so, so in terms of benefits, we're going to assume fixed wages in, in hours across the listing status change. Now, the fixed hours is, is somewhat reasonable. There doesn't seem to be any changes in labor utilization or, you know, across listing status change. The fixed wages, you know, it, we, we have less information about, um, but we do that. But, but making that assumption, we're going to take that 13% increase, apply it to the average, uh, the average mine in our sample, and that's going to give us about a 93,000 tonnage increase of coal per year, given that labor uh, productivity. Okay, if we multiply that by the average price of, of coal per ton, this is leading to an, an average increase uh, upon a listing status change of about 3.2 million. Okay, so, so a nice little bump given, you know, especially when you think the average mine might gross, uh, you know, somewhere in the, in the range of, of, of 25 to 50 million um, in open source. Now, on the, on the terms of costs, you know, there's, there's a number of ways to try and, and quantify the costs of, of this with safety. What we do is look at, look at, the, at the, the stock market reaction for public firms in response to a fatal accident. Okay? And what we see is a 10 day car of, of, of minus 1.4. Right? So, this is the equivalent of a dollar loss of about $31.5 million upon the, you know, this announcement of, of the fatal accident. Okay, if we multiply that by the increase in, in fatalities that we could expect upon a listing status change, we get a cost of a, a little over three million. Okay, to the extent that this car, the stock market reaction, is a reaction to sort of the revealed uh, underlying safety environment of the firm, we can think of this as a rough estimate of, of sort of the overall uh, cost to this, this chosen level of safety. Okay, now, not that this is, is sort of a, a, a thing to brag about or, or, or really be happy about, it looks like the public firms in our sample are, are sort of increasing workplace safety right up to the point where marginal cost equals marginal cost. Right? This is something that's very close, at least in terms of this simple back of the actual population. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. So did, would this uh, cost uh, sort of capture something like insurance costs or the changes in, in insurance? I mean, it depends on what you think of, of, of you know, sort of short run event study reactions to something like this. You know, if I were to if I were to talk to my advisor, you know, John Karpoff, he's done a lot of this type of work for like the revelation of fraud. I think he would he would he would tell you that these market reactions should capture all, all the costs to the firm, right? It's 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 really an all encompassing, you know. And then he's done some additional work that tried to break out sort of the direct costs, you know, of, of penalties and things like that. So I would think. You know, at least my interpretation of this measure is that it should include, you know, things like increases in, in insurance costs, uh, lawsuits, um, you know, workers' compensation claims. All of these things should be bundled. I think, in terms of my interpretation, in a way, in, into that. Measure. There are a bunch of questions. I don't know if you want to just take them. Sure. Now, so I'm I'm about I'm about to go into sort of what we think might be sort of driving it. So you know. There's a lot okay. of questions on the media. Uh, so a couple more questions about the the any potential differences in inspections. Um, I guess maybe you can just show the you know summary statistics on how many inspections per mine based on private and public. Um, but there's a question about whether they're more thorough. I don't know if you could measure that in some way. Um, yeah, I mean these are these are great questions, and you know we, we haven't. We haven't spent a ton of time in the in, in, in sort of the inspection data just because it's not it, it's not a, it, it, there's just less of it. But I think it doesn't start until like 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. Um, you know, I, I, I showed results earlier. You know, if we normalize our violations by inspections, the, the results are even stronger in some sense. Um, but you know, if I were to if I were to stick the number of, of inspections on the left hand side of a regression, it does not change after a change in this inspection. You know, at least with sort of the, the full set of fixed events. So by that measure, it looks like the number of inspections for, for public, privately held and, and publicly held mines are the same. Um, the, 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 the third question is an interesting idea. Um, 
I think, you know, I think what we could dig into with that data is the, the, the number of days that, that sort of the inspector, the number of hours, if it's really short, that the inspections take. Um, I think that, that would be an interesting thing to look at if, if that would proxy at least a little bit for thoroughness. Um, that would be a good idea. Thanks. Okay, um, another question. How is the productivity improvement coming? What, what, where is it coming from? Thir through technology updates or otherwise? New tech, yeah. may, new tech may require learning new techniques, which may explain why more low level accidents occur. Does this affect persist for years? Yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a great question. Something we've been trying to dig into, you know, as I start talking about these mechanisms, you know, one very obvious possibility is that we simply have a capital for labor substitution. Right, so as a as a, a firm goes public or a public firm acquires privately held mines, they become less constrained or able to buy, you know, newer, more productive uh, capital, you know, or technology. But yeah, there's a learning curve, or maybe it's just more dangerous than all, um, you know, and that could explain sort of both of uh, these effects. You know, I think I think what we do in the sub in the sub samples, is, it, you know, next is is going to suggest that's not the main driver. You know, but but again, you know, labor utilization isn't changing either. Um, you know, so it's hard for me to imagine that we have a straight sort of, you know, capital for labor substitution. Um, you know, another thing we've looked at is, is among the public firms that acquire private mines, we look at if there's this huge change in their capital expenditures um, per, on a like sort of a per mine basis, and we don't see that. Um, you know, so I think this is a really good question, and, and at this point, we haven't been able to dig much deeper. Although I, you know, I, I would. Say, I would think that, you know, I, I think I, what I would focus on is, is sort of going back, oops, is, is going back to this, this anecdote, right, um, where instead of stopping to fix, um, or rather than stopping to fix, you know, a ventilation issue, we're producing coal, right? So these hour or two that we're spending on the ventilation fixes, right, these are still worker hours, right? They're still paying their labor. Uh, you know, these are in our data uh, as, as mining activity hours, you know, but they're not producing coal, right? They had to completely shut down. So this is sort of the, the what we have in mind, um, you know, especially since we don't have strong evidence that, that there's a huge capital influx, um, but, but I would guess it's also good. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say about that is if we look at sort of the graphs, the effect doesn't seem to dissipate through time, right? So if it's all that we just have new expensive technology that's, that's better at producing coal, but there's a big labor uh, learning curve, excuse me, you know, we get this huge bump right at, at the time we implement this new tech, uh, this new tech, and then, you know, sort of through time, it, it, it declines. And we see actually something that looks opposite of it, right? Low probability safety violations continue to rise through time, and, and fatalities do as well. Um, and, and, and then finally, productivity seems to be pretty flat, you know, maybe ticking up just a little bit. So it doesn't seem at least that that sort of thing is, is driving the entirety of the result. Although you would think that new technology would, would be one of them. So there's kind of a related question. Is it possible to know whether new pro new projects precede the decision to go public? Uh, so uh, so uh, let me see if I understand. Um, it's sort of like new mines that like we, we sort of are, are, are just digging, like that sort of thing. Is that what we mean by new, new projects? I'm not sure. But the okay. <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, whether there's sort of uh, something changing just before they go public, something in terms of uh, the way that the mine's being run. Yeah, I, this is a good question, and, and I don't have I don't have a great answer. Um, it's something we can dig into a little bit more. You know, one thing one thing that I can say is it it doesn't look that it doesn't look like size is changing a ton. You know, like when, when these mine, mining firms go public, for example, it seems like you know it's not just like. They go public and all of a sudden instead of having two mines they have you know they have 50. you know it's it's a, it's a, it's not as stark of a change as that um but i don't know you know off the top of my head here if there's something in the data we can see that's changing sort of right before this inspection so there's a couple more but i think we're going to hold off on those yep. Yep. great thanks Ryan. Let's see if i can find my place Okay, so in terms of economic mechanisms, like I said, there's there's a number of things that can be going on here. Um, you know, we're 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 tied a little bit by our data. You know, we don't we don't have accounting data for our private firms, for example. You know, we don't have CEO compensation data or performance uh, sensitivity. 
to, to their, you know, their, their productivity or performance uh, in terms of contracts. You know, so we're, we're a bit limited in, in some sense of, of what we can look at. You know, so we're gonna we're gonna focus on on two non mutually exclusive channels that we think are are really conducive to being tested in our data and are are, are you know sort of reasonable um, channels to, to focus on in terms of you know what we, what we're seeing. The first is the role of information asymmetry between sort of really diverse uh, you know public firms uh, shareholders and, and managers, and the second is the role of private firm preferences and, and particularly owners ties to the local. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll be a little more specific about what we have in mind. Okay, so, so starting with information asymmetry, okay? Shareholders of public firms are, are, are more dispersed, right? And, and this leads to this problem in that it's, it's more difficult for, for all the owners of the firm to distinguish between poor luck and, and, and poor decisions or poor skill uh, among the part of the CEO. Okay, and, and the way that we think this is likely uh, has an impact on this, this trade-off decision is through CEOs wanting to keep their job, um, essentially, right? There's this really strong relationship between firm performance and CEO turnover that's well documented, uh, and this this relationship is is sort of exacerbated by the separation of ownership. Okay, so you know, in, in times where where something's going wrong, right? Especially sort of you think broadly speaking at the industry level, managers might feel pressure to try and prop up profitability. Right, and, and take cuts in, in other investments that they could make in order to realize that profit. And, and we think the, the industry itself is, is probably going to magnify that pressure on CEOs. Okay, the first is that coal firms are pretty homogenous, right? Uh, you know, running coal is, is, is similar across different firms. This leads to lower placement costs. And, and as Brino pointed out in, in his 97 paper, more turnovers um, that, that ultimately occur. And at the same time, you know, is, and related to this modernity is that coal's a niche industry. So being a, a CEO at a coal industry isn't likely to give you good experience in terms of being, you know, CEO of startups, right? So their op outside options, if they are replaced, are, are probably limited um, to some extent. Okay, so we're going to sort of focus on, on coal prices. And so this is in the spirit of, of Bertrand and Mullenathan, if you're familiar with their 2001 QJE paper, where they focus on oil prices, okay, we're gonna focus on coal and we're gonna hypothesize that managers are gonna face more pressure to increase productivity at the expense of safety uh, under the following conditions. One, there's a bigger separation between ownership and control, right? And this is we're thinking public firms. So there's a harder time amongst the owners of figuring out if you, if you really have, you know, a, a, a poor luck experience, right? We just got lucky as a manager or we're really making bad decisions. And, uh, and then that's the second one. I, I, I don't know it is. Okay, and it's difficult to discern between these two. And so we're going to focus on a drop of coal prices. Okay, we think uh, there's some, some really nice advantages from using coal prices. One, they're plausibly exogenous to any one firm, any one manager, any one market. Okay, so, you know, there's, there's, there's certainly, you know, endogeneity stories you can tell about coal prices. Uh, but, but, you know, this is sort of the argument in Uber Town Nathan, and, and we think it, it probably holds in our favor. Okay, the, the second thing is coal prices, just like oil prices, tend to have large effects on firm performance. Right? There's a big carry through, a flow through effect from coal prices to sort of ultimate profitability you know, performance. Okay, so, so, so coal price fluctuations have a big, end up having a big effect on, on the, the probability of, of a manager term. And then finally, we get a lot of time series variation across state. And mine type, right? Whether it's a surface or underground mine, and we're going to try and use this variation, these coal prices, to sort of disentangle some some mechanisms. For it. Okay, so this just gives you an idea of, of how much variation there is. You know, the red is is surface, and, and the blue is underground mining. You know, through the year for, for different states. And so, so in every year, we have both coal price declines uh, and, and coal price increases. In fact, you know, we often have in a, in a given state. When, when surface coal went up, then, then underground coal went down. And, and so we have a lot of better pain here in terms of coal prices. Okay, and what do we see? We see that all of the effects uh, in, in our safety violations are concentrated when coal prices are down, right? And, and again, we have results in the subsamples that are significantly different. Okay, and, and we're going to see something extremely similar for, for productivity. Okay, so exactly when you think. You know, this information asymmetry uh, agency cost is going to sort of affect 
managerial decision making most is we see is when we see these these uh these trade out more frequently for public firms than you and we can show that it, it you know on a, a placebo test so we're, we're basically instead of doing sort of the concurrent price changes we're defining it to be the price change two years prior you know we see no significant differences in either safety or productivity you know so you know something of a parallel trade step Okay, so that was information asymmetry, and, and the last thing we're going to look at is the role of uh, community ties amongst private firms. Right, so you can think of what we have in mind anyway is that we have private firm owners that are under diversified. You know, uh, you know we have a much higher concentration of ownership. You know, and, and, and they're likely to reside in, in, in sort of the community in which their the firm is located. Right, and if that's true, they might have ties to the local community that you know sort of exacerbates uh, or drives uh, sort of the personal benefits that they might get from, from keeping the workers safe. Okay, so we're going to construct two sets of empirical tests to, to examine. The first is going to look at the proximity of the mine to the headquarters, right? So just look at whether the mine is either sort of close to, to where the, the firm is headquartered or where owners are likely to reside and those that are far away. And, and then we're going to we're going to hypothesize that this is uh, this trade-off is, is possibly more sensitive to for public firms to changes in the in the probability of detection for their headquarters. Okay. So so first, headquarter proximity. Like I was saying, the owners of private firms are extremely likely to live in the vicinity of the firm. Okay, public firm ownership is more diffuse, and we likely have a larger percentage of, of owners that are likely to reside all over the place, right? At least not concentrated just in that region. Okay, so we're going to hypothesize that the differences in this in this trade-off between public and private firms are likely to be larger for mines that are located near their headquarters. Okay, and so what we're doing here in terms of uh, location of the headquarters, we're focusing on miles. We're going to again look at tertiaire. So we're calling a mine far from its headquarters if it's in the upper tertiaire. Okay, so it, it ends up being about 100 miles um, is, is what we call far. Um, although it, the results are not particularly you know, sensitive to the split. Um, the problem when you get too close, you know, within like 20, say 20 miles, we get less public firms that have, you know, sort of mines 20 miles of the firm. So, so we stick with this tertiary. Okay, and again, what we see is the results seem to be concentrated in mines that are nearby. All okay? right, so just, you know, just in the locations, we think that these, these community ties that private firm owners likely have, um, you know, when, when the mines are located nearby, is, is where we see these uh, big differences in, in workplace safety between public and private firms. And, and, and a very similar story on the first one. Okay, this is the last test. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of wrap up here. Um, so the, the next thing we we try and do is is is, is think through the, the role of the regulator, right? So if private firm managers and, and, uh, and owners really are, you know, sort of thinking of, uh, of themselves as good stewards of, of employment for the local community, then it's, it's plausible and, and, and we think likely that regulatory oversight is just going to play a smaller role in, uh, in this optimization problem that managers are working. Okay, so we're going to use uh, as, a, as a shock to this regulatory in, in, uh, oversight, the, the reassignment or the, the change in, in mission inspection audit. Okay, so mines are assigned to, to, to regional inspection offices, sort of similarly to the, to the SEC, based on ge geographic proximity. Okay, but, but occasionally, you know, whether due to, you know, the changing dynamics of, of, of the coal industry or, or the regulatory industry, mines are actually reassigned um, to, to different inspection offices. And, you know, this can happen through office closure, an office relocation, an entire sort of district uh, reorganization. Um, but, but because of this, the proximity to the regulator, and, and thus in turn, we think the probability of detection is going to change for these, these small, this, uh, admittedly a small subset of mines. Okay, so this proximity to the regulator is similar to some of these papers um, that look at the SEC uh, importance. So Padilla and Raj Kapal, you know, they have this nice JE paper in 2011, and, and sort of use this distance as, as a proxy. And we, again, we think that this is plausibly exogenous to a given mine or, or its parent. And we try to, to, to see if that's true, right? So this is sort of what predicts uh, an inspection office change. You know, public listing status doesn't predict at all. 
you know, consistent with what Misha told us, you know, the number of mines does predict uh, a change and, and the average distance does predict a change. So, um, but these, these things tend to go away with higher, you know, higher level of fixed effect. So the only thing that really consistently predicts uh, an inspection office changes is the number of employees at a mine um, in a negative way. You know, for those things, the more employees, the less likely we are to have an office change. But it, 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 it predicts decreases in proximity and increases in proximity uh, almost identically. You know, so in terms of our identification, you know, the difference is very much. Okay, so to, to give you a visual, you know, I'm going to show you two, two, two inspection office rate signs. The first is from McAllister, Oklahoma, to Longview, Texas, uh, in 2013. You know, so the firms in, in red here, or the mines in red, excuse me, had this big decrease in regular proximity, um, where this, this mine down here in Texas had actually increased in regular proximity from the same. Okay. Now, this one in, in Alabama was sort of the phasing out of an office in Jasper and, and the relocation of these mines to the, the Bessemer uh, inspection office. This happened in the late 90s. Um, and you can see that all of them sort of had a, had a uh, excuse me, increase in, in regular proximity, or decrease, excuse me, um, at least these, but, but, but very different, you know, sort of sizes, okay? So we're going to try to utilize this variation as well. We're going to focus on changes that are only sort of big, right? So what we have in mind for big is, is something greater than uh, 60 mile change. So we can think of this as, you know, roughly a, a two hour round trip change in, 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 in an inspection visit, for example, okay? So we're defining proximity change as, as one, if, if the proximity decreases, and negative one, if the, if the proximity increases, okay? And what we see upon a decrease in proximity to the regulator, very similar results uh, that, that we see in the baseline in that violations do go up um, amongst our private, uh, excuse me, our public firms uh, after these changes, but only in sort of the lower probability violations. Uh, and, and then we also see productivity increases. Okay, so, so again, if, you know, if private firms have a different optimization problem due to their ties to the local community, uh, you know, we can just see the solid evidence that, that might be driving some of our movements. Okay, so I'm, I'm just about done. You know, a, a couple of questions about robustness. Is, is this really is this just an IPO effect? And, and no, you know, we can show that this is in, in sort of a matched acquisition sample as well. Uh, you know, are there anything that's changing in the in your proceeding? And you know, placebo results suggest that's not the case. Are the results similar using alternative measures of workplace safety? So, so these are a bit mixed. I think they're worth showing. Uh, the number of injuries actually goes down. Um, you know, so if we're just doing an, an accident propensity, the injury propensity, public firms are, are more safe. But those that do happen are more safe, and that the employees miss more time from work from that. From that given, which we think is sort of consistent with our, our fatality results. Okay, and then last, you know, is this, is this really about public or private listing status? Or, or can we make some, you know, maybe a little bit more generalizable statement about ownership structure, uh, you know, overall? And, uh, you know, what we've done is, is look at sole props and partnerships. Now, this data is not very good, it's time invariant. It's only for sort of the current owners, you know, as of the, the data download that we did, you know, so we can't use firm fixed effect, for example, but, but in the specification that, that includes the rest of them, you know, we see similar results in that sole props or partnerships do have less safety violations and, and lower prop, uh, productivity. Okay, now to the extent that these are true sole props, you know, where they have sort of unlimited liability, this, this, this result would be sort of completely obvious. Uh, I don't know. It's a little bit hard for me to believe that if they have sort of actual liability, and um, you know, but, but that's just you know, we think it's an interesting sort of way to extend this, this sort of a broader spectrum of uh, structure. Okay, so to, to conclude here, a, a few minutes early, you know, private firms are are a big part of the economic economy, uh, the U.S. economy, but they face unique frictions. Uh, you know, our results suggest that these frictions. Sort of had a large impact on, on the ability or, or willingness for firms to trade off workplace safety for productivity, right? And, and this trade off is concentrated during periods in which separation of ownership and control agency issues are exacerbated. And it's seemingly when private firms have, have ties to the local community, 
So in our setting, at least, you know, it, it does look like a perfect equity is good. It's deadly good. Uh, there are a few questions if you'd like to. Okay. Few Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, so let me just go through them. Uh, one about uh, there's clustering in both, you know, the private and public mines. They they tend to be sort of close together. Um, are, are your fixed effects going to capture the quality of the land? The quality of the land. Um, I hope so. I mean, we have county county level fixed effects. You know, so I, I would think that should should cover the quality of the land um, at least pretty well. Um, I'm not sure we can do anything more granular than that. Um, you know, we could do state fixed effects instead, and, and that will change. No sort of other way of, of of measuring the quality of that land directly. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that. I, you know, off the top of my head, I, I don't know of, of anything that's sort of better control um, than just you know sort of county uh, like a fixed code. But but I can look into that if there's sort of measures of. of so there's a suggestion for uh, looking at variations in workplace compensation regulations across states to get some. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really nice comment. Okay. Uh, more comments about uh, the uh, timeliness of these uh, effects in terms of number of accidents. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible? So. I guess the question is, are the fatality statistics, are those also pretty standardly reported across private and public? Yes, they have to be reported immediately. Um, and, and, and by reported immediately, I mean, you know, to MISHA, you know, so and, and that, I mean, their data has been showing up on sort of the, on the web in real time when a fatality happens, I think back to like 2000, um, you know, and that's public or private. What changed in 2010, 11, is, is the disclosure requirement in the Dodd Frank after a big accident? Public firms had to, to disclose this in an ATA. But in terms of, of reporting to MISHA, you know, this is completely standard. Can you clarify um, these inspector offices? Is that a, a single individual or is that a group of, of employees? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my sense is it's not a single, um, though I, I, I know it, the size of the staff depends on how many mines that. that the inspection office cut this covering. Um, is it possible to identify the individual who carried out the inspection? That I don't think so. Um, but I can, I can, we can ask. I mean, one thing we've experienced is, is Misha has been awesome, with, more than awesome, uh, completely, you know, graceful with, with all of our data requests. You know, um, if that data is not on the website, they, they gladly provided us more. Uh, so I can certainly ask. Uh, even if it's sort of uh, you know uh, an anonymous ID or something. Like so here's that. a um, I, I, if if it's a specific individual who's giving who's more likely to give these uh, violations, um, it's possible he or she is being sent <laughs> to specific money. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, yeah. I guess it's possible that that uh, they're not happy with with uh, the firm that acquired the mine and. Because these yeah. people live locally and they're sending out, they're, they're going to stick it to them, but they're going to stick it to them with these low probability uh, violations. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thought. Um, and, and it's certainly something that I find plausible. Right? If you have a, a local employee of one of these inspection offices, it's just sort of annoyed at uh, the changing dynamics. Um, you know, one thing, you know, we've gotten this comment where maybe, you know, public firms are being nickel to dime, you know, just to, to bring in some additional. Sort of revenue, and, and we don't see that sort of the aggregate fines change. You know, so so even though these 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 violations are going up, the, the, the sort of the total amount of, of fines doesn't change across the system that at least within a month. Um, you know, so it, it doesn't strike us that that they're they're completely being nickel and dime. So um, they, again, I, I find it plausible. So yeah, we can certainly ask Misha for sort of an anonymized uh, individual inspector. Uh, 